Okay, so today we are going to finish up uh, this module uh, by talking about one last item here, which I'm just going to add here. Uh, line integrals, um, Stokes theorem, see that's going to be last. And uh, we're going to first do surface integrals and divergence theorem. Okay, so that will wrap up this uh, vector calculus module. So we've spent um, pretty much the uh, uh, about one month on vector calculus. So I think by the end of this, I expect that uh, you'll be able to uh, do some of these problems in vector calculus that is relevant to the electrostatics module, which we will hopefully start this Wednesday. So a few announcements before we start. Um, we will have an online lecture on Wednesday. So a big blue button, just like before. And the lecture will be recorded as usual. Um, I will be out of town this Wednesday, but we will have our, our lecture at the regularly scheduled time. Um, the second announcement is that our exam will be a week from Wednesday. Okay, first exam will be one week from Wednesday at the regularly scheduled class time. Um, so what I'm planning is that, well, uh, the homework, as you know, is gonna be due this Wednesday, all right? Yes. Back. I'm sorry. Can we push it back today? Um, I'm I'm hesitant to push it back, and the reason why I'll tell you what I can give you all an extra day, like one extra day, but not more than that, because I want to make sure that everyone has enough time. I want to post the solutions, so I'm gonna have a hard deadline then, like you know Thursday Thursday at 12 p.m. If you if you turn it in by Thursday um, at the ECE front desk or um, actually, I prefer that you just turn it in by hand because, like, scanned copies are harder to grade. But um, if you run into any issues, like, you know, any any individuals, like, if you run any issues with that, let me know. What I'd like is for most of you to just turn it in on Wednesday, um, Wednesday or by Thursday morning, uh, 12 p.m., and then I'm planning on posting the solutions by Thursday evening. So that means uh, the homeworks have to be turned in by 12 p.m. I want to post the solutions uh, because I would like you to have the solutions to prepare for the exam. This homework is definitely the hardest homework that's going to be relevant to this um, uh, to this test. Okay. How many of you have gotten a, a start on the homework so far? Okay, great, great, great. Uh, are there any questions that we can go over? Um, we'll, we'll do that at the end of the class because it's important that we get through uh, surface integrals, line integrals, um, divergence theorem, and Stokes theorem. Yes. Will we have like a study guide of like uh, like a prep sheet basically? Yeah, I can probably send something like that out maybe Wednesday or Thursday. Okay. Sound good? It'll give you the topics. Any questions like what we can expect? Mm -hmm. sort of yeah, format of the exam is going to be probably four to five questions, multiple parts. Um, most of the time, it seems like the students always seem to find that the exams do take most of the class period. Okay, despite my best efforts to say, I know, I think it'll be fine. Oh, everyone will finish it within an hour. It always ends up taking longer than expected. So just be ready for that. Um, you are allowed to bring one page of notes front and back, handwritten, no photocopies allowed. Okay, um, and uh, a lot of like the, the, uh, like the charts and stuff for like converting between one uh, coordinate system to another, things like that, those things I will provide to you. Yeah, integral tables and things like that, I will provide to you. Okay. No need to jot those things down. But you are allowed one page of notes front and back. Yeah? Um, would it be possible to post the, like, form, the stuff you're giving us ahead of time just so we like, don't duplicate it on our note sheet? Um, the, the notes, you mean? Um, you know how you were saying like, you'll give us like, the integral tables and stuff? Oh, 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 yes. Is it possible for you to post Okay, so the, so the question is, can I post the, um, what I'm going to give you on the exam beforehand? Yes, I will do that. I'll, like, so I will post that by Wednesday or Thursday okay. so that you have it. That's good. Yep. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any other questions before we get started? All right. Good. So let's get right to it. So where, what have we been working on? We, we talked about vector algebra in this module, addition and subtraction. We talked about multiplication, the different types of dot and cross products. We talked about the different Cartesian uh, cylindrical and spherical coordinate systems. We're going to be doing example problems in those. And then we got into calculus and vector calculus. We started off with talking about 
reminding ourselves how to do integration with your standard uh, scalar functions. One dimensions, two dimensions, so that's the, uh, three dimensions, the kind of stuff that you did in your calculus courses. And uh, then we talked about how you can do the same type of thing in vector systems, in vector fields. Vector fields is where every point in space has a vector associated with it. So um, we talked about gradient, divergence, and curl, those types of calculations with vectors. And today we are going to talk about how we can do integrals, service integrals uh, on vector fields and what that means physically. And we're going to talk about something called the divergence theorem. And then we'll talk about line integrals and Stokes' theorem. Okay, so surface integrals, you can imagine, are two-dimensional uh, integrals on vector fields. Line integrals are one-dimensional integrals on vector fields. So we're going to start with the surface integrals first and then get to the, the um, line integrals. All right. All right. So just a quick reminder from last time in class, we talked about scalar fields. A scalar field is uh, where you have f of x, dx, an integral of that from a to b. That's your typical one-dimensional integral. Yes? Uh, question. Uh, when you post the slides on Canvas, mm -hmm. they still have like the white thing over solutions? And yes. Is there a way we can, like, we can post those? Oh, I do that intentionally. Because oh, okay. I want to make sure everyone's like watching the lectures and going over the lectures and writing down the you know, writing down these things, going over the problems yourself. Actually, what I'd like you to do is go over this, um, you know, do the example problems yourself and make sure that you can do them. Kind of like a homework problem. Because that's a really good way to prepare yourself from the, for the exam. Yeah. So sorry, I do that intentionally. <laughs> uh, One-dimensional integrals, two-dimensional integrals, uh, we, we talked about. So these are scalar fields, right? Uh, we talked about several examples of that last time in class. We, we did a triple integral in Cartesian coordinates, a triple integral in cylindrical coordinates, a triple integral in spherical coordinates, in cylindrical coordinates. All right. So then we got into saying like that. What are um, what are line and surface integrals? So we ended off with this last time. So uh, a surface integral is shown here. A line integral is shown here. All right. These integrals are going to be done on vector fields, not on scalar fields. So that's the key difference of what we did in class last time and what we're doing today. Uh, what do these, vector, uh, these integrals look like? A line integral looks like it, it has a, a single um, integral here, and it's a vector field A dotted with uh, DL. So what happens when you take the dot product of two vectors? What's that? Scalar. You get a scalar. Right. So... So when we attack these problems, we just have to do this dot product. And after we do that dot product, we'll get a scalar, a scalar quantity. And then it's just like what we did before. All right. So it's like is that first step of taking that dot product and converting it into a scalar quantity and then just doing that scalar integral. So a line integral is um, operates on two-dimensional, three-dimensional vector fields. It's an, it's an integral of a vector field along a line. So this is a one-dimensional integral. The surface integral, this is denoted by ds, s for a surface, op also operates on two-dimensional and three-dimensional vector fields, but this is an integral that's taken along a surface, along a two-dimensional surface. But again, we have a vector field dotted, a, d a vector dotted with another vector, and of course the result that you get here is also a scalar. So in a surface integral, you're going to integrate the scalar quantity over two dimensions. So I'm just going to put this extra integral sign here just to show that it's um, uh, two dimensions. All right. But, you know, um, even if you have a single integral sign there, if you say, if it says ds, integrating over a surface, that means you are uh, doing a surface integral. That implies two dimensions. All right. We went over this in class last time, so I'm just going to kind of go through this quickly. Um, it's important to know how to calculate the tangential and normal components of a vector uh, along a surface or along a line. We talked about how you calculate the normal projection on a line. Um, it is just the, uh, um, you use dot products to do that. So let's go over um, how to calculate the tangential and normal components again real quick. Um, so imagine that we have this vector E, okay? Um, and, this, and we have a surface... Uh, we have the surface. Um, we have the surface n like this. Okay, I'm sorry. The surface is green, and how do you define a surface? You define it by its surface, uh, its normal vector. 
Okay, imagine a, th a, 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 a plane in three-dimensional space. All right, one way of defining like what the angle of that plane is is that you say what the normal vector is. Right, if, if uh, my finger is pointing in the direction of the normal vector, that means I know that the angle, the, the way that the plane is oriented in three-dimensional space is, is always orthogonal to my finger. So that's what's, that's what's shown here, okay? N hat is the normal vector for the surface that's shown in green. So N hat is, uh, this green arrow here is orthogonal to the, um, the green surface, uh -huh. all right? So now imagine that we have this, um, here we go. Imagine that we have this uh, uh, additional uh, vector, E, that's, um, that's in some kind of random direction. What we're interested in finding is, can we find the component, the, the tangential and the normal component of that vector E along the, uh, along the surface normal vector? So in other words, like from a more intuitive standpoint, E has, E's gonna have multiple components, right? E, e will have, it's pointing in some random direction, but some component of that E is going to be parallel to the surface of the plane, and some component of that E is going to be perpendicular to the surface of the plane. And that's what's shown here with um, EN and ET that you see up here. There's a tangential component that's parallel to the plane, and then a normal component that is perpendicular to the plane. All right, so the, the way that we go about figuring out what these normal and tangential components are is that we take advantage of the fact that we know that the uh, plane is defined by the surface normal vector n hat. So in order to find this, the normal component, that's the one that we find first. To find the normal component, the normal component is just the projection of E on n hat, okay? The, um, and when we talked about projections and components earlier, I'm, I'm in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go into the details of it, um, the projection is equal to the component of E on n hat multiplied by n hat. And uh, that comes out to be equal to E dot product with n hat times n hat. Okay, and this E dot n hat, okay, um, if you recall, the dot product of A dot B is equal to the magnitude of A times the magnitude of B times the cosine of the angle between them, cosine of theta AB, all right? So um, now what's happening here is that n hat, this has, so E dotted with n hat is going to be equal to the magnitude of E, magnitude of n hat times cosine this of the angle between E and n hat. All right, that's what this angle is shown here. This alpha angle that you see, the angle between E and N hat, that's what that alpha uh, angle is. N hat has a length of one, right? The unit vectors always have a length of one. So then this just simplifies to E cosine alpha, and that's what you see here. Okay? So if I were to ask you, if I were to ask you, if I give you some vector e and I give you, um, you know, a plane that's defined by its surface normal vector n hat, you should be able to tell me the angle theta. You should be able to calculate the angle. All right. You should also be able to calculate the normal component according to the formula that you have here. And then finally, you should also be able to calculate the tangential component. The way you find the tangential component is by first calculating the normal component. So you find, um, you find the EN here, and um, the tangential component plus the normal component is equal to E, so um, the quick and easy way of finding the tangential component is to take the full vector E, subtract out the normal component, and you'll be left with, uh, left with a tangential component. All right, so this is just using dot products and math to figure that out. Um, we can do a quick example of that here. So imagine that we have three points that define a plane. Um, P, Q, and R define the surface normal vector, um, and then find the uh, tangential and normal components of, um, of A on the surface. Right. So I think I had done this, I think I had done this problem earlier, so I'm just gonna pull it out, make sure it's up here. Yeah. 
All right, so we'll go through this solution quickly. Um, so first of all, three points to define a plane. All right, P, Q, and R. Okay, there's two ways to define a plane. One is that if you have the surface normal vector and a single point on the plane. That's one way of defining a plane. The second way of defining a plane is to actually have three separate points. All right, if you have three separate points in space and you connect those three points together, you're going to have a plane. Does that make sense? Nod your head if you're <laughs> if it makes sense. Three points in space defines a plane. Right? Okay. All right. So um, uh, here's what we have to do. Um, the first thing we're going to do is uh, uh, find um, the equation for n hat. So the first thing to do is to find um, equation. Of the find an equation of the plane and find find a um, uh, a vector that's perpendicular to it. Oops. All right. So the first thing we're going to do is find n hat. That's the surface normal vector. All right. How do we do this? So imagine that you have three points in space: P, Q, and R. One, two, and three. I'm just drawing them arbitrarily. I'm not even trying to draw out um, the specific locations of them, just so you see that this technique works very generally. Imagine that these P, Q, and R define a plane. Okay? So if, if you draw a triangle between them or whatever, the plane of that triangle, the surface of that triangle defines a plane. And we, what we are interested in finding here is what is the surface normal vector coming out of this plane? All right, we define the plane with three points and we want to find the surface normal vector. So, um, how do we find, conceptually, how do we find a, um, a vector that's perpendicular to two other vectors? Cross product, exactly. That's what we want. So let's talk about what we have here. We want to find n hat. We know n hat is pointing right out of the surface. So what we can do, our strategy, is to take, let's take this vector hue here, PQ. We'll take this vector here, PQ, and we'll also take a vector QR. We could take PR also or QR, it doesn't matter, any two of the vectors. Let's say we take two of those vectors like this, and uh, and then we take, so we'll I'll draw PQ like this. So this is PQ, and then this is Q, um, QR. Sorry, I don't need to redraw that. We have two vectors, okay? And um, if you take the cross product between those two vectors, you are going to get a vector that is perpendicular to both. Okay, that's one of the key properties of the cross product. All right, so our strategy is that we want to find, we want to find a vector. We'll take PQ cross product with QR. Now keep in mind, I just did PQ and QR, but you could take any combination of these uh, of these vectors. I could take PQ, PR. I could take PQ, um, QR as I did. I could take QR and PR. It doesn't matter. Any combination of those vectors will give me a surface normal vector. Okay? All right. So, um, so the first thing we want to do is find PQ. So the vector PQ will be equal to, we have these two points here, P and Q. So we can take uh, Q, um, uh, the a coordinates of Q and subtract out the coordinates of P. So 3 minus 1 is 2. 1 minus negative 2 is 3. And the last coordinate is 4. So that is our vector PQ. Then our vector QR is equal to, you take the coordinates of the R minus the coordinates of Q. Yep. Question? So you subtract the, the two. Mm-hmm. 
Yeah. Are there any other questions? I see some nodding heads back there. You good? Yeah, so the way that you find a vector, you want to find a vector going from this point to this point, right? So if you subtract the coordinates, you're going to get the delta between them. A vector is the delta between the two points. So that's why we're subtracting them. So QR, we're going to take the R coordinates and subtract out the Q coordinates. So 0, 0 minus 3, negative 3, and then um, negative 1 minus 1, that's negative 2, and then um, 2 minus 4 is negative 2. All right, so we have our, our ah, sorry, <laughs> our vectors P, Q, and Q, R. So now we're going to take the cross product between them. Um, okay, so P, Q times Q, R. We take the uh, cross product of these two vectors, and the cross product in Cartesian coordinates, we draw out this determinant matrix is x hat, y hat, z hat. We put in our pq vector on the second row, so 2, uh, 3, 4, and our qr vector on the, on the third row, and that, that's negative 3, negative 2, negative 2. When we take the cross product of this, um, I'm just going to show this really quick. It's x hat um, minus 6 plus 8 minus y hat uh, negative 4 plus, what is that? Negative 4 plus 12 um, plus z hat negative 4 plus 9. And then we get this vector um, 2x hat minus 8y hat plus 5z hat. Okay, now we're not done yet. Okay, the cross product of two vectors gives us a vector that's perpendicular to both. Okay, so that's good. That means that this, this vector that we just figured out here is perpendicular to the plane. We know that for sure. However, what we, don't, what we don't have yet is that the unit vector, the, unit, the definition of the unit vector is that it, is, it has a length of 1. Okay, so this vector here does not have a length of 1. So in order to find the unit vector for the cross product, this vector that we've found, we have to divide, divide by the magnitude. All right, if you look back at the notes, we talked about unit vectors and how you figure out the unit vector. So... The n hat is going to be pq crossed with qr divided by the magnitude of pq cross qr. All right, we take a vector and divide it by the magnitude, and that's what that's what we get. So um, the magnitude, I'm just going to put this up here: pq times qr is equal to the square root of 2 squared plus 8 squared plus 5 squared, the three components of it. And this comes out to the square root of 93. Okay, so then the, the surface normal vector is 1 over the square root of 93 multiplied by um, 2x hat minus 8y hat plus 5z hat. All right, so we went through all those steps to find, um, uh, to find the surface normal vector. And then um, after that, now we want to find the tangential and normal components of A on the surface. The key thing is that we know n hat, so now it's just a matter of applying the formulas. So, um, so step two is going to be the uh, find the normal component first. All right. Uh, so you're going to use the formula A. The normal component is equal to A dot n hat 
multiplied by n hat. This is the um, this is the projection of the vector a on the surface normal. Okay, um, so we will just we will just do um, let's see a is um, a dotted with n hat, so it's going to be um, so our a is what's given here one two three. And our n hat is um, is given here, 1 over 93 times 2 x hat minus 8 y hat plus 5 z hat. The dot product of these two is going to be 1 over the square root of 93. And then you take, um, you sum the product of each of the components. So a, you know, a is, um, the first component is 1, multiply that by 2 here, 2. You multiply the second components together, 2 and negative 8, that's minus 16, and then 3 and 5, so that's plus 15 here. Okay, uh, multiplied by n hat, and this comes out to, um, did I get that right? Um, yep. So this is this comes out to one equal. I'll just put this here. One over square root of ninety three times n hat. Okay. Now n hat is this um, is this quantity here. One over square root of ninety three times two x hat minus eight y hat plus five z hat. So you multiply this whole thing by one over square root of ninety three, and you get um, one over ninety three times 2x hat um, minus 8y hat plus 5z hat. So that's how you find the normal component and then the tangential component uh, is just um, a tangential is equal to a minus a sub n. So you take um, the a that you calculated, one two, th one, two, three, minus this quantity here. So I'm not going to bother doing the math there because it's just, I'll just write it out here, minus 1 over 93. And I'm writing this in the vector shorthand without the x hat, y hat, and z hat. So I'll just put 2, negative 8, and 5. Okay. Yeah, just keep in mind, this, this last statement I made, made here is just, uh, I wrote it in the vector shorthand without the x hat, y hat, and z hats. Questions? So it was just subtract the vector right? Yeah. 1 over 93. Yeah, that's right. You can just do, you can just subtract these two vectors and you'll get the tangential and, and normal components. Is this be on the exam? Yeah. Oh, yeah. This kind of stuff will definitely be on the exam. All right. So we have uh, an hour and 10 minutes, and I want to cover, I want to spend about half that time on surface integrals and divergence theorem, and the second half on line integrals and Stokes theorem. Okay. So uh, uh, are there any questions about the tangential and normal components before we move on? So the surface integrals, um, remind me, I, how many of you have done surface integrals before? Oh, you have a question. Uh, just a question for the 1 and the 3. Mm -hmm. So would it be positive 1 over 93 or negative? That's still like 1 over 93. Um, this one here, the bottom part here? Yeah. It, it would be minus because you're subtracting out the, the okay. normal component. Okay. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Um, so let's talk about surface integrals. Um, first of all, has has anyone done surface integrals before for vector fields? Yeah. Okay. Great. 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 Uh, kind of. Okay. 
Well, let's let's back out and talk about like why would engineers care about surface integrals? Why are surface integrals helpful? Um, so if we think about um, think about a situation where you are designing a parachute, okay, and um, you want to make sure that the parachute, you know, you make a you know you have a certain surface area, you decide to make the parachute a certain size, and uh, and you calculate out. Um, what the velocity of that person is going to be falling at, and then you want to calculate how much force is the parachute generating. You obviously want that force to be large enough that it slows the person down so the person doesn't break, break their head when they hit the ground, right? So when you're designing the parachute, the things that you have to think about, if you think about this from just a mechanical engineering standpoint, we're not mechanical engineers, most of us, but just think about it from, um, from a mechanical engineering or physics standpoint, that uh, you have the surface of the parachute, um, and each point on the parachute is generating a force, an upwards force, that's slowing the person down, right? So. Can we recognize, we can recognize the fact that the different points on the parachute may have different amounts of force. Maybe the most force we'll find like right in the middle of the parachute, and then right at the edges, maybe there's not so much force at the edges of, of the parachute, All right? Another thing you can think about is like, if, if, the person, if the person under the parachute is pulling one of the ropes, then it changes the angle of the parachute, right? And that's, what, that's actually what causes the person to like, causes the parachute to go left and right, you know, you can pull on the ropes. But when you change the, when you pull on one of the ropes, then the angle of the parachute changes, and then you have different forces on the left side versus the right side. All right. So the point I'm trying to make is across this parachute, there is there are different forces. It's not the same everywhere on the surface of the parachute. So if you want to calculate the total force, you can't just take an average. You can't just take. Um, you can't assume that the force is the same everywhere on the parachute and just multiply up all the different force contributions. What you have to do is you have to do an integral. Okay, what the concept of an integral? The concept of a service integral in this case is we're going to be adding up the the vectors that are perpendicular to the surface. Um, let's keep it. Give me a second here. So we're, we're going to be adding up all the force vectors that are perpendicular uh, to the surface. And that will allow us to get the total force on, um, on this uh, parachute. So you think about this, is that um, every point on the surface, we have, we have an arrow. And that arrow represents the force on that particular portion of the parachute. We think about the parachute as, um, you know, break that parachute up into small components like this, mini sections, okay? And in each one of those sections, we want to calculate the total force on, on that particular section of the parachute. So we, um, we're going to calculate the total force on this little block, this little square block of the parachute. We're going to calculate the force on this block of the parachute, the force here. And in order to find the total force, we're going to sum up the force components on all those little squares that we've broken up the parachute into. All right, that is the concept of an integral. You calculate the force at a specific point, and then you integrate the force over all points along that surface, and that will give you the total force. All right, so another example we can think about is in electromagnetics. In electromagnetics, one of the things that we find is wherever we have a positive charge, wherever we have a positive charge, that's going to generate an electric field, right? What direction is that electric field pointing if we have a single positive charge? It points in all directions. It points away from the positive charge, right? Okay, so now suppose instead of just a single point charge, let's say we have, okay, let's draw this out. All right, so in electromagnetics, we know that a single point charge is going to generate electric fields going out in all these different directions. Okay, so what if we have a distribution of charges? What if we, what if we say that there, um, there is a charge distribution 
over an area like this, and we say that the charge distribution is, is going as, um, there's a low charge distribution, uh, low charge density on this side, high charge density on this side, just picking a, a random example. So let's say we have a low charge density on this side, and then on this side we have a higher charge density. So we have lots of charges there. Okay. So now we want to find the electric field. How do we find the electric field of this kind of situation? Right? This is an example of a problem where we need to do surface integrals. And the concept here of surface integral is that we are going to integrate um, integrate the electric field components over this two-dimensional surface. So this little guy is going to have an. Um, this is going to have a um, uh, an electric field that's generated from that. This one is going to generate an electric field. This one is going to generate an electric field. And all of them are going to generate the electric fields. But the total electric field is going to be summing up the contributions of every single charge. Whenever we think about summing up contributions of fields over the entire surface, we think about surface integrals. Okay, so in this case what we would do is if we wanted to find the total field at any point, we would actually have to integrate the electric field components um, uh, from, for all the charges on, along the surface. I'm intentionally not going into the details of this. I'm just going to say that the, um, the total electric field is equal to the surface integral of, um, of, all the, uh, of all the electric field components due to yeah, of all the electric field components due to each particle. We will get into the details of this in the next module, but I'm just trying to give you an example that why surface integrals are important. In, uh, in electrostatics as well as, you know, this very intuitive parachute example. All right, so let's talk about what surface flux is. Surface flux is the sum of all the stuff going through a surface. Um, and the way that you can think about that is imagine that these blue arrows, these blue arrows represent, um, as, we, as we were talking about, the force vectors on, on a parachute. But um, these force vectors, these arrows, are going through the parachute. That's what this referred to as a surface flux. So in a surface integral, we break the surface up into tiny squares. In each square, we take the dot product of the vector field and the surface normal vector s. And what that allows us to do, it allows us to sum up the surface flux. It allows us to sum up all the stuff that's going through uh, a surface. All right, so let's see what that means. Um, let's imagine that we have, let's imagine that we're just taking, I'll draw this in a different color. Um, let's say that we're talking about this box here, okay? This box has a surface normal vector n hat. Just this box. All right? So if we're looking at this uh, differential surface, we call this the differential surface. differential surface, and that is denoted ds. Okay, and this s, just to make sure you know that this is, it's a vector. All right, let's take that little surface here, and look at that closer. It's a differential surface, and that differential surface, of course, has it has uh, a length, also has a width, so it has an area associated with it, and it also has a surface normal vector n hat. Okay, so those are the properties of that differential surface. And uh, the way that we say the, the way that we can denote that in vector form, 
Um, let's see, do we have something on that? No. The differential surface has a, a magnitude. It's a vector quantity. So this ds is equal to n hat d a. Okay, d a is the area of that differential element. Again, starting from the beginning, we took this parachute, or we took this surface, and we broke that surface up into a bunch of small areas. Okay. And then when we break up those, those small areas, we have, think about each one of them has a is a box. It has a length and a width. It has an area. We call the area of that surface the differential area, dA. And, um, and then there's also going to be a surface normal vector, n hat, that is perpendicular to that surface. So the way that this dS quantity is defined is dS is equal to n hat dA, the differential area. And that differential area can be found by um, you know, multiplying these two quantities together. Usually there'll be some kind of differential length of the two sides, depending on what kind of coordinate system we're in. If we're in the xy coordinate system, that, that L and W might, might just be dx and dy. But if you're in a different coordinate system, the dA will be different. All right? So, um, and then this is our vector field. The vector field is usually given to us. So what we have to do is multiply, take the dot product of A with this uh, differential surface dS. And what does that physically mean? What we are doing is we are taking the vector field, and when we take the dot product of that vector field with dS, what we're essentially doing is we are taking, we are finding the component of that vector that is normal to the surface. So this dot product, we take the dot product of the vector field A and the surface normal vector S, and we get the component, the component of A on the surface normal vector N hat. All right, the component. So we're only looking at the portion of the arrow that is perpendicular to the surface. We don't care about the tangential component, we only care about the normal component because we're interested in what's going through the surface, not what's going along the surface, not what's going tangential to the surface. We care about what's going through the surface. That's why we, we care about the perpendicular component, the normal component. So component of A on N hat is what we're doing. And this is a scalar quantity. This whole thing, this whole thing here, is a scalar quantity. So once we do that a dot ds product, then after that is just a regular integral. Okay. All right. So let's take an um, example here: a surface integral in uh, cylindrical coordinates. Right. Um, so. Imagine that we have uh, the S is the surface of the cylinder, uh, R equals three from for Z uh, from Z going from zero to five, and A is a vector field defined in cylindrical coordinates, and you are asked to find uh, find the integral A dot ds, and we're using the outward pointing normal vector. In other words, so we're taking this surface. We're taking the outer surface of the cylinder, this portion here. So I'm just going to draw these lines so you see the surface that we're talking about, the outer portion of the cylinder. R equals 3 for z between 0 and 5. We're not doing the surface integral of the top and bottom. We're only doing it for the, um, uh, we're only doing it for the, uh, the two sides here. Okay, so let me see. I think I have it here somewhere. It's not. Um, if not, it's a problem. We can we can do that. Um, so how are we going to go about doing this? We have a five-step process. Okay, um, when you do these integrals, I want you to have a um, you know a methodical way of doing it. 
So what is A? What is DS? What is A dot DS? What are the limits of integration? And then the last step is actually performing the integral. All right, so let's go through each step of the process. All right, so we're trying to find the integral of a dot ds. All right, so let, let's do a little bit of the um, a, a little bit of the groundwork here. All right, the first step is what is a? What? is a okay we have uh, the val uh, 2 r 1 2 Z so 2 r times r hat um, plus 1 times Phi hat plus, uh, what was the last one here, 2z, 2z times z hat. All right, so our vector field is defined in uh, cylindrical coordinates. Next step is, what is ds? Let me see if we erase this. Okay, so the next part here is, the, the key question is here is, what is ds? How can we define ds in the cylindrical coordinate system? This is the part where you have to look at the surface that you're integrating. We are integrating on the surface of the cylinder, right? So if we were to draw, um, we're going to be taking uh, a differential surface that looks like this across uh, on the outside of the cylinder. All right, so let's make that bigger. If it helps, you can draw it like this. I mean, in some cases, it'll just become intuitive. All right, so this... We have the surface normal vector that points outwards like this. And then we also have a length here and a length here. Now think about the cylindrical coordinate system. And what is the surface normal vector here? R, r hat, right? In the cylindrical coordinate system, the r hat vector always points in the um, outwards. So this is. Ah, sorry, I'm pressing this. This is r hat. So ds, the way our methodical way of finding ds is that we find the unit normal vector. So n hat is a, is a normal vector. And then we say da. That's the area of that little differential element. So in this case, r hat is the normal vector. And we have to multiply, let's just say, the length and the width here, just for, you know, say L times W. So in this case, what is L? That's correct, dz. This is the, the, the length here. This is, in the, this is the z coordinate, right? Z coordinate, so that, that L coordinate, the length of that little differential element is dz. And how about the width? It's close. Think about uh, it's r d phi. Yeah. Don't forget that. This is, this is the trick you got to remember in in cylindrical coordinates. We're looking at the arc length. This is this is an arc length. So this width, this is dz, but the width here is going to be equal to r d phi.
All right, so this is our ds element. This is really the hard part. After that, it's just all map, OK? So um, third step, what is a dot ds? a dot ds equals um, taking the dot product and cylindrical coordinates. The dot product is always pretty straightforward. You just multiply. It's it's the product. It's the sum of the products. So um, it's um, so we have two vectors here. This is our ds vector. No, notice that the ds vector just has an r hat component, right? doesn't have a phi hat component, doesn't have a z component. It only has an r hat component. So you take the two r hat components. The a has an r hat component, 2r. 2r, you multiply that with the r hat component of ds, which is dz r d phi. dz r d phi. Um, and then you're going to uh, take the product of the phi hat components. This is 1, and this has no, ds doesn't have a phi hat component, so this is 0. And then uh, ds also doesn't have a z hat component, so that is also 0. OK, everyone see that? All right, so this ends up becoming 2r squared um, d phi dz. Okay, so the next step is the limits of integration. All right, so we are going, the surface that we're integrating is the one out here. Right, so if we want to integrate that surface, what are the two variables? Remember, if we want to integrate, we want to create a surface, we need to, uh, we need to get a span of two different variables. If we want to get a volume, then we have to take a span of three different variables. Right, we're trying to get a surface, so what are the two variables that we are going to take a span of? Z and phi, right? So, we, we, so let's write that down first, Z and phi. So our range of z is going to go from what what to what? Zero to, five. 0 to 5, right? So you just write that down. And then what is our range of phi? 0 to 2 pi. Got it. Perfect. So good. Now we got our limits of integration. And this sets us up, sets us up nicely to just do the last part, which is find the integral. All right, so um, integral of a dot ds. All right, we already found out what a dot ds is. So a dot ds is 2r squared d phi dz. And we already figured out our limits of integration. Oh my, sorry. So we are going from phi is equal to 0 to 2 pi. And our z is equal to, is going from 0 to 5. Now, one other point I want to make about the limits of integration. If we also want to put r in here, what is r equal to? We're on the surface of the cylinder. What's that? There's no range for r, right? We're at, but we are at a specific value of r. 
it's one, right? I think that's um, r equals three. Yeah. All right. So if you put if you do these things beforehand, it's very methodical, and you can um, it makes the doing the problem later easier. So wh when we do this surface integral, our z is going from zero to five, phi is going from zero to two pi, and our r is equal to three. So in this problem here, now we can actually substitute r equals three up here. So we just do two times three squared d phi dz here. Phi equals zero to two pi, z equals zero to five. Now, um, this is just a straightforward integral. So this d phi, when we take the integral of d phi with respect to phi here, we just get a two pi there. And then when we take the integral with respect to z, we get five there. So this becomes two times three squared times um, two pi times five. So the surface integral along the outer surface there is two times um, two times nine. That's eighteen. Eighteen times five is ninety. Times two is one eighty pi. All right. So we did all that for the um, to find the the surface integral just along the outer the outer surface there. All right. Um, so everyone with me so far on this one? Okay. Now. Um, the answer here is actually 270 pi because we um, we also have to take into account the upper surface. So the upper surface would be the one up here. And then we have to take into account the lower surface down here. All right. So 180 pi is correct for the surface integral just on the outer surface here. But now let's also do the same for, um, uh, for the other ones. Let's do this. Uh, we can do this fairly quickly so you get an idea. Now that we know how to do this, we can do the second one fairly quickly. Now I'll just go through that process again. What is R or what is A? So we already answered that. We don't need to answer that. Two, what is ds? All right, so in this case, we are now on the top of the cylinder. So the surface that we're looking at is the top one. So this is for the top. A has not changed, but ds has changed. All right, so now what we're doing is we are looking at a differential portion of the top. So it'll look something like this. A portion of the disk on the top. Okay, you say that again? Since we have R given for the straight, can we just get the surface of the circle? Oh, oh, okay, good point. Yeah, you're saying since r is equal to 3. No, that's that's a good point of clarification. What we are doing now is um, we're actually done with this problem, okay? We, we did the problem for r is equal to 3. We did the outer surface of the cylinder, right? Right now I'm going doing a second part of the problem, which is looking at the top and bottom surfaces. So what is, what is the top and bottom surfaces? The, the r is not equal to 3 on the top surface. The r goes from ze between 0 and 3. Right? So for the top surface, r goes from 0 to 3, and then phi goes from 0 to 2 pi. That's the surface there. The z is fixed on the top surface. Right? We'll get to that in a second. So when we're looking at the top surface here, we look at the surface normal vector. And then we look at this length and this length. So um, ds is equal to n hat times d um, dl d you know this is dl and then the width here like this. 
You, we call it L and W, but DL, 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 DW is also fine. They're the differential lengths. All right, so what is the surface normal vector? What is n hat equal to? It's pointing in the z direction, right? So this is z hat. How about the how about this one? This length element here. This is going to be dr. The change in the radius. And this one. How about d uh, dw? R d phi. You got it. Awesome. Okay, you guys are totally getting this. It's great. Because this dw, is that's an arc length. So we multiply by r d phi. And really, if there's any questions about this, you know, you can always refer back to, um, you can always refer back to our, uh, our table. All right, pardon me for saying that. <clears throat> Yeah. This table here lays out all the differential lengths in a particular coordinate system. So we're in the cylindrical system. Notice that we've been using r hat dr, and then this is phi hat times r d phi, and then z hat times dz. Now, actually, right now, what we're doing is we're looking at the differential surface areas. So in the first problem, in the first problem, we were looking at um, the the surface area that was pointing in the r hat direction that was the outer edge of the cylinder so that was the ds operator was r hat times r d phi dz we figured it out from you know just by looking at the geometry but you could also look it up on a table like this when you're uh, w when you're looking at the surface with that's pointed in that has a surface normal in the r hat direction you just use this first one now what we're doing is we're looking at the one at the top of the cylinder the top of the cylinder points in the z hat direction, and so our, our differential surface is going to be r dr d phi. So that's the easy way of doing it. But we, um, I like doing it intuitively like this, so r dr d phi comes out here when you do it like this as well. All right, so we figured out our uh, ds operator, so z hat r dr d phi. So now we do a, what is a dot ds? a dot ds, we, um, we had three different components of a, 2r, 1, and phi. 2r, r hat, plus 1 times phi, hat, plus 2z, times z hat, and we're gonna take the dot product of that with um, z hat r dr d phi. So these two terms basically go away, and you're just left with the z hat terms that you multiply together, so you get two z r dr d phi. Fourth step, limits of integration. All right, so we are on the top surface, the top disk. So what is our range of integration for, for R? It goes from zero to three, right? Uh, how about our phi? Zero to two pi, right? Okay, that's our two variables that have a range, and what is z equal to? On this top disk, everywhere on that top disk, z is equal to a constant value, actually. It's equal to 5. You guys see that? Everywhere on this disk on the top, z is equal to 5. Last step is just to do the integral. So 
So um, a dot ds r equals zero to three phi equals zero to two pi, and our a dot ds is just two z r dr d phi. All right, we can substitute our z equals five right here. And then we can separate out the variables as well. So z, this, this two times the five becomes 10. And so we're gonna separate out r equals zero to three of 10 times r dr. And then we have our five example here, zero to two pi d phi. The integral of 10r is, um, uh, what is it, 5r squared, going from 0 to 3, and then this is just 2 pi. So 3, three squared is 9 times 5 is 45 times 2 pi, and then this comes out to 90 pi. All right. Whew. Okay, so we did we did the outer. Then we did the top. And I'm just going to tell you guys that if you do the same th same process with the bottom, um, the the uh, integral of a dot ds is going to be equal to zero. You can do that yourself to prove to yourself that that's the case. The quick reason why. What's that? Right, 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 right. So this last surface, this bottom disk here where z is equal to zero, that's the last one that we're doing. And if you do that yourself on your own, you'll find that that bottom one is equal to um, uh, zero. So now this is the part where we, we start putting stuff together. Um, in the next slide here. All right, so what, what, what did we just calculate? We calculated the surface integral first on the sides, then on the top, and then, then on the bottom. What is that telling us? That's telling us that it's the, surface, it's the surface flux that is going out of that cylinder. Um, does that make sense? It's the total surface flux going out of that cylinder. We look at all three, all three sides of the cylinder, and we look at all the vectors that are pointing out from each of the three sides. We took the surface integral from the top, bottom, and sides, and that gives us the total amount of stuff coming out of that cylinder. So that gets us into the divergence theorem. The divergence theorem states two ways to calculate the total outward flux from a volume. Why, why use it? Um, the divergence theorem is useful for calculating the total outward flux. We calculate it in the long and painful way, and there's a shortcut using the divergence theorem that we can use to simplify this calculation. All right, so uh, the divergence theorem is useful for converting an integral over a volume to a surface uh, containing that volume. So let's say we'd like to avoid doing surface integrals. We just did them right now. We know that they're time consuming because you have to sometimes take the surface integral on multiple sides of an object, of a volume. Um, the divergence theorem is a shortcut to that. And the divergence theorem looks like this. We just calculated the, um, uh, the surface integral of a vector function. So we calculated the right-hand side of an equation like this, and we calculated this on a cylinder. The divergence theorem is telling you there's a shortcut way that you could use to calculate the same total surface flux by using the, um, by using the divergence of A. So the, the integral, the triple integral of the divergence with respect to volume is equal to the surface integral 
with respect to the outer surface. So what does that all mean? Um, these are just two ways to calculate the net outward flux. Um, this is a good one to think about. So you remember we were talking about a single point charge, right? We know that with a single point charge, all the lines, all the electric field lines point outwards from that single point charge. All right. So if we look at the surface out here, we draw a little imaginary spherical surface around that um, uh, uh, around that surface. And what we're interested in is we are trying to find the net outward flux. What is the net outward flux? The net outward flux is the, the sum of the stuff that's going out of the sphere. It's the sum of all the vectors that are pointed perpendicular to the spherical surface and we sum all the normal components of those vectors along the surface. So it's the sum of all the stuff, all the electric field vectors that are pointing outwards from the surface. All right, so let me just ask you something intuitively. Do you guys remember what divergence is? What is the definition of divergence? Yeah, go ahead. Vectors. Yep. The, the, div the divergence of a vector field is a measure of how much are the vector fields going outwards from a specific point. Okay. So you can kind of see that this is where these are two ways of describing the same thing. The, div the definition of divergence was basically telling you, telling you how much the vectors are pointing away from any certain point in space. So you have this point charge here. Uh, there's a high divergence here because the vector lines are pointing away from that particular point. But, you know, th this, this is also the definition of divergence. This is also the, the definition of divergence is how much flux, how much outward flux are you getting from any point in space? So there's two ways to calculate this net outward flux. One, one way is the way that we did it earlier. We look at this entire surface and we take the surface integral of that entire surface. That's one way to calculate how much stuff is coming out of that surface. The second way of doing it is that we take the divergence of the vector field. The divergence of the vector field is how much stuff is going out at any particular point. So the di divergence at the center is really high because there's a point charge there and there's a lot of a lot of vector lines that are coming from away from that point. Um, but there's also divergence at this point in space, there's a divergence at this point in space, and divergence at this point in space, and so on. So the way that it turns out that the the total the, the net outward flux from the surface is equal to the integral of the divergence of the field. Okay? So we're gonna take the volume integral, everything inside this surface. It has to be a closed surface. Everything inside the surface, we take the volume integral of the vector field, of the divergence of the vector field A. Okay? Um, so let's do a quick um, example of that. So I, I want you to see a practical application of it. So we look at the total outward flux from the cylinder. What did we find? We found that the outward flux here the flux, what was the flux here that we calculated? 90 pi. Okay. Um, what was the flux here that we calculated? Well, we didn't actually calculate it, but it's, it actually comes out to zero. Flux is equal to zero. All right. Now, um, the flux on this surface. Right. So what we calculated here, the total flux. So the total flux is equal to uh, 90 pi plus 270 pi. I'm sorry, 980 pl 90 plus 180 pi. So this is equal to 270 pi. That's the total amount of stuff, the total amount of, vec of those vectors, the sum of all the vectors going out of the surfaces of that cylinder. 
All right. So the second way, the second way of calculating the net outward flux is by using the divergence theorem. And I'll show you that that, that that can actually allow you to calculate it a little bit quicker. All right, so I'm just going to... Um, outward flux by divergence theorem. Okay, so we'll see the net outward flux. I'm just denoting that as a um, uh, abbreviation here. Net outward flux is equal to the triple integral, the volume integral of um, a. I'm sorry. Of del dot a dv. So this has to be a closed volume, okay? So just putting a, a circle here denotes that it's a closed volume. So the first thing we can do is figure out what is del dot a. All right, so uh, this is the part where we actually have to, we're trying to find the divergence in a different coordinate system. We have to kind of remind ourselves that um, we can look it up in the table here. So we want to find the divergence of the vector field A in cylindrical coordinates. Okay, and this chart shows you it's 1 over, is, this is showing rho, but like just imagine that the rho is equal to r. Because the in this table, they actually, um, they use this rho in cylindrical coordinates. And I think it's, it's more intuitive to use r, but... Um, we just have to make sure wherever you see that, just put an R instead. So there's a formula here for it, okay? The, the Cartesian formula is very straightforward. So just remember that when you're in a different coordinate system, if you're doing divergence and curl or gradient, you have to keep in mind to use these formulas properly. All right, so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write down the formula for divergence there. It's 1 over R... Um, d dr of r times a sub r and i'm just copying down the formula here plus 1 over r times d d phi of a sub phi plus d dz of a sub z all right, let's remind ourselves what A is. A is equal to, um, let's look at here, it's 2R1 and 2Z. So it's 2R times R hat plus 1 times phi hat plus 2Z times Z hat. All right. So um, when they when they talk about a sub r here, this is a sub r, the r component. This is a sub phi, and this is a sub z. So we're just talking about the different components of the vector. So the first step, we're finding the gradient. I'm sorry, we're finding the divergence of the field. So this is 1 over r times d dr of r times 2r plus 1 over r times d d phi of 1 plus d dz of 2z. All right, this one goes away. This is 2r squared, and, and the derivative of 2r squared is um, 4r. And then you divide that by r, so you get 4 here. And um, the derivative of 2z is 2. So you get 
6 here. So the divergence of this field is just equal to 6. It's a constant. Well, that makes things really easy. Did I get that right? Yeah. So if we were to take... Um, So we're going to take the, the integral uh, over the cylinder of del dot A. So now we have to figure out our limits of integration. We are integrating over a volume this time. So let's just draw that out. Well, we're, we're integrating over the entire cylinder. So what is going to be the range of the three variables? What is going to be the range of R? It's going from 0 to what? 0 to 3. Our phi is going from what? 0 to 2 pi. And Z? 0 to what? 5. Five. Right. So the dr, d phi, dz. So, um, Uh, this just comes out to uh, um, it's because it, it comes out to like the uh, pi r squared times six. So I'm just gonna. Is it six r? Oh yes, r dr. Thank you, r dr d phi dz. Thank you. So when we do the math, I'm skipping over the math here in the interest of time. So this comes out to pi r squared times h. This is just the volume of the cylinder times um, times six. This is because um, the reason why the shortcut works is you know I just don't assume that it works in every time. But when you when you have a constant and you're just integrating over a volume, that just becomes the the volume the volume of the cylinder times the, the constant. But I suggest that you actually go through the steps because I think it's best to just have a methodical way of doing every single problem. But I'm just taking a quick shortcut here to save us a little bit of time. Um, so this becomes pi times uh, 3 squared. The height, the height of the cylinder is 5. This so comes out to 6. So 30 times 9 is 270. Pi. Okay, so what we did here is that we calculated the net outward flux using the divergence theorem. Before, we calculated the net outward flux using the surface integrals. Both ways are, there are two ways to skin a cat, right? Like you, you can find the, the net outward flux using the surface integrals, you can find the net outward flux using, using the divergence. So this is a good way to check your work because if you find it in, um, we calculate it using the first method, we calculate it using the second method, we get the same answer, right? That just, that proves to us that the divergence theorem works. And for you, when you do something on a test, if you want to like just check over your work, if you have two ways of finding the solution, you can use it to find, um, uh, you know, see if it matches your previous calculations. So divergence theorem will work all the time the divergence theorem theorem will work all the time just make sure that it has to be a closed surface a closed surface meaning you know a closed like sphere. sphere the cylinder that we did was a closed okay. surface then the divergence theorem is valid okay. yep okay in both cases you're calculating the the outward flux from a closed surface one you're integrating the divergence within the volume and in the other case, you're, in, you're doing the surface integrals over the outer surface. All right, I'm going to skip over this example here because um, uh, I would like you to do it as, as a homework problem or as, a, as an example problem. So this is an example of a divergence theorem in Cartesian coordinates. Right? This is where we are actually going to be taking the total outward flux from the surface of a cube the net the unit cube like this 
All right, and I would like you to do this problem using the divergence theorem in both forms of the, um, both the left side and the right side. So calculate it using surface integrals, calculate it using the divergence theorem, and you will definitely find that in this case, the divergence theorem is much easier to, to um, using the divergence is much easier than doing all the surface integrals because you're gonna have surface integrals on six sides of the cube. So you have six different surface integrals that you have to do. It's a painful problem, but it's a really good practice if you want to make sure that you know how to do the steps of this problem. This is a good one to do it. All right, the last 15 minutes I want to talk about line integrals. And, um, you know, if we have questions on this, we can come back to it, um, come back to it next time. So, um, suppose we have a vector field A. Um, in a line integral, we're looking at each point along the line and integrating the components of A that are tangential to that line. So you think about a scalar integral like this. This is the, the types of integrals that you guys are familiar with. You have a, um, a y is equal to f of x, and then you just imagine that you draw that line um, in, a, in, a, um, in a plot like this. What, when you're doing, when you're calculating the integral, what you're doing is you're calculating the area under the curve. So at any point, imagine that this is, um, oops, there we go. So imagine that you have some, at any point x, um, so this is the point x, f of x, and what you're doing is um, at that particular point, um, you're taking dx, the dx is the, um, the width of this differential element, so it's, it's the width here, and when you take dx and you multiply it by f of x, what you're actually doing is you're finding the area of this little rectangle here. All right, and then when you integrate, what you do is you essentially you find the area of this rectangle here next to it, and then again you find the area of the rectangle next to that. When you do the integr uh, when you do this integral, this is then equal to the area under the curve. So. When we do line integrals, it's also a one-dimensional integral, but it's a little bit different. Now imagine that A is a vector field. So let's say we have a two-dimensional vector field, as you see in this example here. Um, you have this vector field A, and then imagine a line that you're drawing in here. Since we're doing a line integral, imagine that you just have an arbitrary line shown in green here. And at every point along that line, if we just pick, uh, picking this point, for example, um, there's going to be a tangent vector at that point. So if we pick the point that's shown here, the red dot here, the tangent vector points off in this direction, and you get this uh, vector dl. Okay, if I were to point, pick a different point in space, let's say I pick this point, then the dl vector at that point points in this direction. The, the convention is that you always go in the counterclockwise direction. So if you're wondering, like, should it point in this direction or the, or the other direction, think about when you're going in the counterclockwise direction that the DL vector is always going to point in the counterclockwise direction. So it's not this one. It's the one that's pointing in the counterclockwise direction. So what we're doing here is um, the DL is unit vector is a unit vector tangent to the line. So the line that you're integrating. And then the A is just the vector field. Okay, so why do we want to do line integrals? What's, what's the physical meaning of a line integral? Um, just like before, like when we, in the, when we were doing surface integrals, we calculated the net outward flux. It's a, it's a, it's a measure of how much stuff, how much the, the vectors are going out of a particular surface. Now for the line integral, the physical meaning is, imagine that we have a closed line here, like you see here. Um, the, the line integral gives you the circulation of the vector field along that line. And what the circulation means is that it is it has to do with the tendency of this object to rotate if it were in that field. So the way you can think about it, the way I like to think about it intuitively, 
is imagine that these are um, the vector field. All the arrows that you see here, they're force vectors. Okay, imagine that they're force vectors, and then imagine that you took an object, an object, the shape of this line here, and you just put that object in that force field. Okay, the question you want to ask is, will that object rotate? That's what the circulation is. Okay, just like when, when we were talking about curl, we're going to see that the line integral is very related to the curl. Um, but the circulation is basically like you put that object in a field and, and you look at the tendency of that object to rotate. All right, so uh, uh, I guess an intuitive example that I like to think of is that imagine that these, these vectors that you see here, the vectors are like the, the flow vectors of a stream, like a river. Okay, and then you put an object in that um, on the river. You like take a little floating object like a raft or something. You put that raft on the river. Will that raft rotate? That's what the circulation is. It's the tendency of the object to rotate. Very related to curl, as we'll see. So line integrals can be taken on an open or a closed line. Um, so this is a dot dl. Uh, this can be uh, in uh, this is an example of a closed line. This is an example of an open line. Okay, when we start talking about the Stokes theorem and the circulation, you have to be talking about a closed line. So, our strategy for doing line integrals is that we do the same type of approach. What is A? Figure out what is A. Then we figure out what is DL. And then what is A dot DL? And what is the range of integration? And then, and then we perform the integral. So um, I want to go through uh, an example in the next five minutes. And then we'll do probably end up doing the second example. Um, if we have time, we'll do the second example. All right. So it turns out line integrals might actually be a little bit e uh, quicker than surface integrals because it's only a one dimension thing. So uh, let's do this. Um, where's the first example here? Yeah. So I'm going to do this example right on here. All right. So what we are uh, we are uh, we have this vector field. It's a two-dimensional field. A is equal to uh, zero times x hat plus three y times y hat. Find the line integral of a along l1 and l2. L1 is a horizontal line extending from x equal two to five, and y is equal to two. L2 is a vertical line with x equals three and y ranging from one to six. All right. So let's do the first one here. Let's do L1. Um, now let's do that one in blue. Yeah, so L1. So uh, our, A, our A is given here. So that's A equals 0 x hat plus 3 y hat. What is DL? OK. Now, for L1, you can see that the line is going in, in the horizontal direction, right? DL always points in the, in the tangent, is tangent to the line. So what is DL going to be, what, what is going to be the direction of DL? So DL, like, the, um, anywhere along this line, the tangent vector is going to point in the direction of x hat. You guys see that? So in this case, dl is equal to dx. dx times x hat. All right, so let's remind ourselves what DL is. I, I have a feeling we're not going to get to the second example, then um, that's OK. Now let's just get a, get a little bit of an intuition. We'll come back to this and talk about Stokes theorem the next day. Um, so what we're doing here, remember, line integral. The line integral is you're, going, you're taking the integral of a vector field along a line. And every point along that line, you want to point, you want to find what, what is the DL vector. And the DL vector always points in the, um, in the direction of uh, it's tangential to the line. 
So this is an ex extremely simple example where we have a very straightforward, the DL should be just intuitive. You don't have to do any, you don't have to look it up on any chart or anything like that. So this is a horizontal line. So um, DL always points in the X hat direction. It's pointing from left to right. And then the magnitude of DL, remember DL is a vector quantity. It has magnitude and direction. So the direction is X hat and the magnitude of it is just the differential length element in the x direction. So it's dx times x hat. So the next step is what is a dot dl? So this is step two. Step three, a dot dl is equal to zero three y dotted with Okay, notice that this just has an x hat component, so the shorthand way of writing that, you put the dx here, this is the x hat component, and the y hat component is what? Zero. Good. So dx, zero. All right, so a dot dl is equal to zero, the dot product of these two is zero plus zero. So a dot dl, the integral of that is just equal to zero. All right, so we don't have to even have to worry about steps four and five here. So we found the line integral for L1. Let's do the line integral for L2. So L2 is this vertical line. What is the dl vector in that case? dl is equal to dy, that's right, times y hat. All right, so a dot dl is uh, 0, 3 dotted with 0 dy. And now this comes out to be 3 dy. OK, so in this one, we actually have to do the integration. So we're going to do, um, what is the range of integration here? So I'm going to move this 4 over here. We're integrating from y equals 1 to 6. And what is our x equal to? What's that? No, we're along this vertical line here. We're along the red line here. So what is x equal to on that? Nope. X equals 3. We're on, this, we're on this vertical line here, the red one. So everywhere along that vertical line, x is equal to 3. x is equal to 3, and y is going from 1 to 6. So that's what, you know, that's what you're given here. You're, you've defined the line here. So x equals 3. So the last step, we've performed the integral. And I, you know, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to squeeze this in here. Um, so the integral, you're going to go from y equals 1 to 6 of 3y, 3 dy. And this is just equal to 3y going from 1 to 6. So that is equal to um, 6 times 3 is 18. 18 minus 3, which is 15. Okay. So these are examples. This is a, a very simple example of a line integral. So what happens if you have to do this green line here? That's what we'll talk about next time in class. Okay. Since we have not finished the Stokes, um, the Stokes thing and the line integral, you should be able to do all the problems in your homework except for that last one. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to have our online lecture on Wednesday. I'm going to go over how to do the problem. The homework will be due at 12 p.m. on Thursday. Okay, And it will be due at the ECE front desk. If you're not able to make it, you can maybe have a friend drop it off. Maybe email it to a friend who's coming and they can print it out and, and drop it off at the EC front desk. I would like to post the solutions by Thursday night so that you can um, study for the exam. Uh, why is uh, A3 not 3Y?
because it's the new wild there. Um, so here, like, um, oh, it's 3y. No, you're right. You're right. This should be 3y. Oh, okay. Yeah, it should be 3y dy. So, uh, yeah, then let's fix that. Let me fix that. That's that's a good point here. All right. Thank you. I'm going to fix that for the recording as well. So that, that should be 3y dy. Okay. So um, if this is 3y, um, 3y dy, then... It's the integral of 3y dy. Okay. And so this will be what? Um, uh, 3 over 2. 3 over 2 y squared going from 1 to 6. So 36. Can you guys help me out with that? Yes. Yeah, 6 times 2, 3, 3 by 2, 54. 54 minus 54 minus uh, 3 1 over 2, right? Yep. 52.5. Okay, great. Okay. All right, thank you. Uh, thank you for that. Uh, I sent you an email early today, and uh, mm -hmm. can you confirm the attendance? So, because okay. my confirm attendance. The, oh. the state, yeah. Because you didn't okay. confirm. I thought I'd done that. Okay, I will, I'll check on that right now. Okay, thank yeah, you. Thank you. Oh, Thank you.